Good evening, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to our worship service, online worship service. Let us prepare ourselves and to sing the prelude. Let me read to you from Psalms 66, verses 1 to 9. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bow down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see what God has done, how awesome his works in all men's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on food. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, O peoples, let the sound of His praise be heard. He has reserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Let us sing our opening hymn, Blessed Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. In his blood, this is my story. This is my song, raising my savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song.
am happy and blessed Watching and waiting Looking above Filled with His goodness Lost in His love Let us come to God in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, all praise and glory unto you, O Lord. Indeed, the whole world will shout for joy and sing the glory of your name. How awesome are your deeds! So great is your power. By your word, the whole world come into being. With your breath, life came into all mankind. Forgive us and cleanse us. Make us whole again as we enter into your holy presence. Thank you for gathering the gathering of the body of Christ today. Though far apart physically, but united in love and in spirit. Help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And may your holy presence minister to each and every individual gathered here. Speak through your servant, Mr. Yusuf Chua, that his lips will be anointed to bring forth your word of power and conviction. Use each one serving today as your instrument of worship unto you, that your name be glorified and magnified. We pray and give thanks in the most precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us together affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now come together and worship our God and give our Lord and our God all the praise and glory that He deserves. Shout for joy and sing your praises to the King. Lift your voice and let your hallelujah. Joy. 
We want to thank God and praise God for all these worship songs that we can sing and praise and give praise unto God. Now, uh, Ryan Sia will read to us the scripture passage. Today's scripture reading is taken from Romans chapter 14. Accept him whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eat, eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be should be fully convinced in his own in his own. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God, and he who, who he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. None, for none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You, then, why do you judge your brother, or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put anything Put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in it, in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the living, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for, wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine, or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whether you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Amen. Thank you, Ryan, for reading that uh, long passage. Okay, today uh, we are joy. <coughs> it is our great joy to have again Mr. Yosua Chua to speak to us. Mr. Yosua studied theology at uh, Seminary uh, Theology Malaysia, that is SDM in Seremban and graduated in the year 2010. Now he is working in SRSB, the Skola Renda Seri Pabisterin, as a vice principal. And uh, Mr. Yosua has been a regular speaker and he is now part of GGBP. So uh, without further ado, I will pass this 
this time to Mr. Joshua to speak to us from the word, the sermon title, Living and Walking in Love. Mr. Joshua. Um, thank you, Edwin. And uh, thank you, Ryan, for that reading. And good afternoon, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, greetings from Taman Banda, Batu uh, Pahat. So today we are going to be looking at uh, a very controversial topic or possibly controversial topic. So um, I would urge all of us to stay calm and uh, not uh, freak out. Okay, we are going slowly. We will go slowly here. I know the reading doesn't show anything, right? But we are going to look at a few things here. Okay, so let us pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for this wonderful afternoon where we can gather together and we pray, O oh God, that as we uh, take time to pause, to meditate and to think through your word, Lord, we pray that our hearts, our minds, our souls will be edified by your truth and that our lives will be changed and our community and our church will be changed and will be edified by your spirit and that your spirit will use our church to edify the town of Bad Bahad and also the surrounding families and peoples around. So we pray for your spirit to come this afternoon and use your word to heal us. You use your word to teach us. Use your word to build us up in truth and in love. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, whom we love, in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's jump in. Okay, uh, some people have said, I'm going to share my screen so you don't have to see my face much. Um, Okay, let's see. Okay, I believe you can see this, everyone. Yeah. All right. Okay, I'm gonna tell you. Okay, so we are we're just doing a little overview of uh, what we have looked at. Um. Uh, you know, in in the last few weeks, right? We have been doing a study uh for Romans twelve, thirteen, and now fourteen. Of course, there's a bit of a there was a bit of a shift in terms of the schedule, but that's fine. Uh, so the overview, basically, of the book of Romans, uh, the book of Romans, if you don't know this already, I think a lot of people know this, but the book of Romans is, is one of the, the most, um, well, how do I put this? The, the book of Romans is one of the greatest pieces of religious literature that was ever written, right? It is a piece of philosophical excellence that is that, is, that, that, that no Greek, even the Greek philosophers cannot match, right, for his time. Beautiful language, uh, very, very well articulated and argued, uh, and laying out the case for Christianity and the good news in such an orderly and uh, beautiful way, which, you know, people who study, scholars who look at it, they, 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 they marvel at the, the beauty of the language and the argumentation of the Greek as well as the, the Jewish ways of arguing uh, shown both in the book itself. Okay, so that's just overview of the book of Romans. Now, the book of Romans, of course, as you know, written to a uh, church in Rome, right? A church whom, Christ, uh, whom Paul has not visited yet before, wanting to go, but prevented to. And he's writing to the church in Rome, uh, expressing, you know, what he knows and believes to be the gospel, the good news. And so it is a magisterial, a beautiful book of art, right? A, a, a wonderful work that has been, kept and preserved for us to study until now, right? And um, it lays out the breadth and scope of the good news for the Jew first and then the Gentile. And chapters 1 to 11 are the extended presentation of the good news. So it, it presents the arguments for why faith rather than works or why um, the law is important, but yet at the same time, faith is, is the central part of what, what Jesus did on the cross, right? And then chapters 12 to 15, which is the section that we are looking at, is actually divided into about two sections. The, the book of Romans divided into two sections. First section is that presentation of the gospel, and the second section is 12 to 15, which is a series on practical applications on how we can live out the good news, live out the gospel in our day-to-day -day life. So 12 says, chapter 12 says, Therefore, I urge you, my brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies a living sacrifices, right? Holy and pleasing for this is your rightful act of worship, right? So this is the, uh, the, the beginning of that whole 12, 13, 14, 15, right? And then uh, we, we, we've heard chapter 13 talk about, you know, we uh, listen to authorities, those in power. And then today we are looking at chapter 14. 
right? 15 uh, closes that whole section on application and then the, the second part of 15, there's that whole section on Paul explaining what he wants to do, some personal instructions and so on. And finally, chapter 16 is his final greetings to the church in Rome, which is really amazing if you think about it because he has never been there, but he knows so many people there and he says, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, right? He knows so many of the people in Rome. It's really incredible. Anyway, so that's the overview, okay? Now we have the chapter 12 to 15 and and we're looking at it a little bit more closer here. We look chapter 12. The pers- uh, chapter 12 is essentially some applications on how you behave, right? Uh, we should not look at one and uh, look at it, look at ourselves more highly than we should. Uh, we should be humble and we should not conform to the pattern of the world. It's more individual based. Then chapter 13 is regarding uh, behavior with the governments, right? And society, people dealing with people. Then Chapter 14, which is what we're looking at today, is our behavior in the church, okay, and in the community of God. So let's look at that. Now, before we go into the text, which has been read out for us by Ryan Sia just now, I'm going to tell us a story, okay? Now, this is a fictional story. Uh, it has not, not happened, and I'm not trying to address anybody in the church at all because it is it has not even happened before. So it is a hypothetical scenario, right? So I'm going to, in this in our talk today, we are going to, I'm going to give you two scenarios, right? One scenario now, and uh, I'm going to explain the text. And then at the end of the sermon, I'm going to give the answer, the solution to this scenario, which ends with a problem, by the way, the scenario. Then at the end of that resolution, I'm going to give you another scenario for you to think about. And then after that, I will show the, uh, I will answer that and give you a resolution for that. And then we'll close. Okay, so let's go. Now. Story time. During the end of the year, Christmas evangelistic meeting held by a local church, a Malay family decided to attend the meeting online because it was a mix, a physical as well as online. After listening to the message, the father and mother were so touched by the message that they gave their lives to Jesus there and then. They and their four children indicated to the leadership of the church that they would want to start attending services, although online only, for obvious reason. Now, after some discussion among the DC, the leaders decided to allow for this. After personali- personally verifying that their decision to become Christians was genuine, six months passed, and after attending some follow-up courses as well as getting connected with some of the CGs in the church, their faith grew to a point that they were now sharing some of their newfound joy of salvation to other members and friends and families that they knew. Finally, in June, the church decided to organize a family day celebration and a dinner once certain restrictions were lifted. And everyone, including these three, now three new families, bravely decided to attend the dinner held on the sprawling and beautiful church campus on a Saturday evening after service. So it's a wonderful dinner uh, that they were attending. Everyone was assigned various tables in the open air and the families were dispersed among the other church members to encourage more fellowship and getting to know you. Unfortunately, when the food was served, these special families started to feel a bit uncomfortable as the sweet and sour pork dishes and pork trotters were served. The children of the families asked their parents what the meat dishes were as they had never seen them before in their lives. And although there was only one lemon chicken dish and some other vegetable dishes with the not so easily seen pot lard added to the dish, the two staple dishes of many Chinese meals were staring right at these new friends of the church. As each family struggled and squirmed with the food options on their respective tables, they had no choice but to partake of the rest of the other dishes as they were very uncomfortable with eating these pork dishes so quickly after they had believed, having not eaten them before. This created feelings of unhappiness for the other church members on the table as they didn't get to eat the lemon chicken or vegetable dishes as these families finished these dishes as they were so hungry. After the dinner, these families left the celebration dinner feeling confused, uncertain, and even questioning themselves whether they made the right decision to join the church and accept Christ in the first place, if this was the kind of, the, um, this is the kind of treatment they're going to be getting in the future. 
They even had to endure much persecution and ostracization from members of their own community to only be humiliated and left hungry by the seeming insensitivity of the organizers who also selected the menu items. To make matters worse, the other members of the church who sat at their tables also left the dinner feeling sour and unhappy, even though they, they ate the sweet and sour pork. Right? They felt sour and unhappy that they couldn't try the wonderful vegetables and chicken dishes and decided to complain to the church leadership, stating that since these new families had already accepted Christ, they were no longer bound to their old ways and religion, and therefore they should be taught to eat pork. As this matter caused some disquiet among members, it was eventually brought up during a family dialogue. And although some members suggested that all meals should not have any elements of pork in them, other members disagreed fiercely, claiming that these new friends of ours need to learn how to overcome their erroneous beliefs of the past and to boldly embrace the new realities of their faith in Jesus Christ, where nothing that has been made clean by Christ should be called unclean. Wow, got Bible verse more. As a result, there was much confusion within the church about this matter, both during and after the family dialogue, as no suitable solution could be decided. And finally, at the AGM, after a long and heated discussion between both sides, a decision was finally made that all dinners would be henceforth cancelled, and all members who may want to eat anything should do this at their own respective homes. Do you think this was the best way to resolve this situation? How would you have solved this? Okay, so with that thought uh, scenario in the back of our mind, let's go into the text. Now, as we, as we have seen, as uh, Romans 14, I'm going to just split it up into a few sections, okay? So Romans 14, 1 to 4. Now, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgments on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Now, this is, let me give you the scenario of what was happening in the Roman church at the time. Okay, the Roman church consisted both of Jew and Gentile. And for a Jew, a Jew doesn't eat pork. A Jew doesn't eat crab. A Jew doesn't eat, you know, some many other kinds of uh, 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 things. Okay, And so you have the Gentiles as well, the the Roman citizens, right, who eat anything, right, and they all come together and then they eat together. And can you imagine the uncomfortable scenario that they are in? Do you get the Jews to force them to eat pork, or do you, or you not eat pork for the rest of your time? Now, by the way, I, I, I read somewhere that the Romans love suyo, okay, they love suyo, pork belly, right, and they, and the way they prepare it. Right, it's very similar to how we Chinese prepare the suyo, right? So it's lush, juicy, fat, right? And Romans love it. Okay. So um they call it pancetta, right? Anyway, so the point is that the these Romans, the Roman Christians, right, they, they want to serve their, their 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 wonderful dish, right? And all these Jewish Christians who are brothers in the same church cannot eat the pork. Okay, so now they are faced with a problem. So who gives? Who relents? Is it the, the, the Jewish Christians who then say, look, you know, um, we are Jews. We don't eat pork, right? You know, so please don't serve pork. Then the Gentiles are like, no, no, no. Uh, we love pork and, you know, there's no more Jew and Gentile in Christ anymore. We are brothers and, you know, you, you're no longer Jews in the sense of your old ways of Judaism and so on. So now you should be able to eat pork with us. So you know, you have that one problem. Then the other problem, you have another problem, right? Which is the Jews, right? They are not allowed by rabbinical law to eat with the Gentile. So what you may get in the, in the Roman church and some other churches as well, right? Where there was a, was a significant Jewish community. Um, you will have maybe groups of Jews eating among themselves. And then you have Gentiles eating among themselves in the church itself, right? So that creates a sense of cliquishness, right? You know, you've got this, Jewish clique and then you've got this Gentile clique and that doesn't help in any way to kind of bring the, the church, this small community of believers together because everyone's kind of like, no, I'm my gang and you're your gang, you know, and, and, and they cannot come together because of the food that they eat or the laws that they follow. So Paul is trying to resolve this issue by teaching them a very basic principle about Jesus's love. Okay, so let's look at this. Let not the one who eats 
despise the one who abstains, okay? And let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats for God has welcomed him. So he's talking about Jew and Gentile, right? One weak person eats only vegetables, but one can eat anything, which is the Gentile. So he's trying to say the Gentile can eat anything and the Jew only eats vegetables. For example, because he cannot eat pork, right? So he has to eat vegetables. Okay, so, so Paul is saying, don't judge one another, right? Don't, don't the one the Gentile say, hey, come on, Jew, like try a bit of this, right? Or the Jew don't judge the other person and say, hi, yeah, this fellow is all not caring, lah. you know, you don't care about us, lah. you this, I don't know. And you have that kind of sense of, judgment that comes into the whole thing so here paul is laying out the case and saying we need to be able to receive one another and uh, regardless of our cultural backgrounds and to understand one another deeper right okay next section one person esteems one day is better than another while another esteems all days alike each one should be fully convinced in his own mind the one who observes the day observes it in honor of the lord the one who eats eats in honor of the lord since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. So Paul is saying, look, if you eat pork, it's not wrong. If you don't eat pork, it's also not wrong. Okay? Now, some of the Jews, they, they valued certain days as really, really holy. Right? So for the Jews, they have three main festivals in a year. You have the Passover, you have the Rosh Hashanah, which is the Yom Kippur. And they have the, the festival of Sukkot, these three main festivals every year. Of course, the most holy day of all is the Yom Kippur, which Yom Kippur means the day of atonement. And that day is the most special day for the whole Jewish people to this day, by the way. Right? So what happens is on that day, everyone will be fasting. Everyone will not eat on that special day. Now, can you imagine for a Gentile Christian at the time in Rome and in other places as well, of course, but Imagine you're a Gentile believer, right? So you're not a Jew and you've got these Jews who are fasting and they take that day so seriously and they come to worship and then all the other Gentiles are, ah, hee hee, ha ha, hey, what's up, man? Hey, hello, da, 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 da. And these Jews are all kind of like, you know, these people are showing such great disrespect, you know, to me, to my cultural identity, who I am. And, uh, you know, they get upset, okay? The Jews get upset. Now, it's, these, these Jews are not doing anything wrong. They, they are just following, you know, the cultural kind of uh, belief in the Day of Atonement. Now, and, and, and also the Bible, which is built on the Jewish faith, although it's built on the Jewish faith, but it's not bound by it anymore because of the New Testament. What is happening is that the Gentiles are coming in and say, ah, yeah, what's, what's, what's one day over the other day? Okay? Why, why do you guys take it so seriously? You shouldn't, you shouldn't be... Um, uh, so, so concerned about this because every day is now the same. Okay, so who is right? Is it the Gentiles right, or is it um, the, the the Jews right? Do they need to go back to that whole thing about oh, uh, everyone has to follow the Jewish mosaic laws. Everyone has to follow. You cannot eat pork. Cannot eat this and so on and so forth. Do you need to go back to that? Answer is no. Right. Right, so one esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one stands and falls before the master, Jesus Christ. Right, so the one who observes the day observes it to honor the Lord. The other who abstains, the one who no, sorry, the one who eats eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So each person can do what they need to do. Paul is basically saying, let each of them do whatever they are convicted to do. Right? If you're convicted to honor the Lord in this way, as long as you're not disobeying the Lord and you're not dishonoring the Lord, right? please be given the freedom to do so. Now, unfortunately for us, when we are living together in close community, sometimes you know, what one does affects the other person and what this other person does affects the other person. And if you want to say, uh, let this guy do this and let that guy do that, you know, Will that create a problem? The answer is yes. I mean, you know, let's say you tell you tell the the the, the us normal Christians, you want to eat pork, eat pork, ah. Then you tell the the our let's say you know in this scenario the scenario I gave the Malays, if you don't eat pork, don't eat pork, ah. All right? It's not as simple as that because you get that scenario where I, I shared I mean gave the story where they all come together and they're supposed to be eating a meal together and then there's just so much. 
you know, negative feeling that comes out of each one trying to um, do what they want to do. Okay. So by just saying, I just do whatever you want to do. Lah, you know, it's not as simple as that. And Paul actually takes great length as we can see here to explain the reasonings, how and what we need to do. Okay. So for none of us, verse seven, verse, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ lived and died, died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Now, what Paul is trying to say here is this. He said, trying to resolve this problem, he says, okay, all of us belong to the Lord. Okay, the Jew and also the Gentile belongs to the Lord. The Jew, Jesus Christ has died for you. Jesus Christ has paid for your soul with his own blood. And for the Gentile, Jesus Christ has died and paid for you by his own blood. So Jew and Gentile, you know, Chinese and Malay, or, or it can be anybody, it can be the, the Indians as well, right? You know, all of us are bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Our souls are valuable in him and we do not own our souls anymore. It does not belong to us anymore. Our lives are not our own. And I think that is the most important uh, lesson, right, that we can learn here, which is that our lives and our souls are not our own. This is compared to what the system of the world thinks. The world says, no, 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 no. I get to decide the rules. I decide what's right for myself. I decide what's right for my family. I decide what's right for my, you know, whatever. It is me, myself, and I. I am the final say in that sense. That's how the world thinks. But Paul is trying to show to the Roman Christians that this is not how you should think. You should be thinking that I am not my own. And what that and how that translates is, let me go to the next one. Okay. All of us are equal before the Lord. Okay? No one is better than the other. No one is smarter. No one is more qualified. No one is more rich. No one is more poor. No one is more you know, experienced or not experienced or whatever. No one's more handsome. No one's more ugly. No one's more, you know, whatever, right? Nobody can say, I'm better than you, so you must listen to me kind of thing. It is all of us will stand before the judgment seat of God equally. And if we equally stand before the judgment seat of God, let us treat one another like equals. Okay? And when we treat one another like equals, we can't say, hey, you know, like, hey, you know who we are? No, no. Hey, hey we all Christian. Uh, we all live so long already. We have been eating more pork. Uh, you know, da, da, da. So you guys uh, learn to catch up a little bit. Uh, hello. You know, we, we can go into that whole mode of thinking. Or the other group that says, they just accepted Christ. And they said, hey, come on, you know, like, will you not be compassionate on us a little bit? You know, we all accepted Christ and we are from this background, all that kind of stuff. So what do you do? If, if all of us are equal, if all of us treat one another as equals, then we can discuss, we can talk as equals. The problem is we don't do that. In church, we don't do that. We, we, we categorize, right? We discriminate one over the, oh, this one is this one, this one is, or that one from a, from, from a more influential family, or this one from, you know, he's, he works as this kind of job, so he's more, he has more influence, or like what James talks about, right, in the book of James, where a rich person comes into the church, a dato comes into the church, a tan sri comes into the church, right? You know, let's say Robert tan sri, Robert Kwok comes into the church. Everybody all sit up, Okay. Or, you know, if uh, Tun Dr. Mate comes into the church, everyone sit up, you know, or, or you know, the Menteri Besar or the Sultan or the Agong or whatever. I mean, not to say that you shouldn't show respect to some of these leaders, but, you know, when a rich person comes into the church, all of our behavior changes because we treat this person differently, right? And the, the rich person was like, expects to be treated differently as well, right? So, but Paul is trying to say, don't treat one another differently. Regard one another as equal because all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're educated, whether you're not educated, whether you're experienced or not experienced, all of us will be treated the same by Christ. So why then do you despise? Why then do we look down on one another? 
why then we do we treat one another in this way, right? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So we should not put ourselves over another person, whether because of our achievements, status, qualifications, or lack of them. Right? We say, oh, I'm more qualified. Oh, I studied the Bible more, you know, so I'm more knowledgeable and all that. That is the wrong attitude as well, right? So as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. So every single person will come to God and will be judged by Jesus Christ on judgment day. So we should all therefore treat one another equally, right? As equal human beings. This is a very, very revolutionary idea. It's a very incredible idea because the system of the world is not like that at all. The system of the world is always hierarchy, is always class-based. Meaning, you look at the, one of the oldest civilizations in the world, the Indian civilization, right? Uh, Indus Valley, Harappan uh, civilization, right? Very, very advanced civilization, has its own plumbing and stuff like that. But the Indian civilization, they have classes, they have a caste system. So you've got the, the rich priests on top, the Brahmins, right? Then you come down, come down all the way down to the lowest class. You go to China, same thing. You've got the emperor, and then you've got the court of the emperor, and then you've got all these mandarins, right? All the the Huan, right? All the people who, who, who managed to take the exam now the, the good thing about this is that in china you have that meritocracy system where you can take the tong cow this big exam and and if you do well you can get in to become a, a government official right but that's about it right within that you still have a hierarchy you've got a different levels within the mandarin system itself you've got one two three four five six seven eight nine right and then you have a very strict hierarchy and also the the the, the mandarins on level one you know you, they will do certain things that other mandarins cannot do and so on and so forth then you go to Europe, you go to the serfs, right, in the feudal times, right? Also, you have got the kings, you've got the aristocrats, you've got the knights, then you've got the, the, the normal common folk, and then you've got all, so you've got always these kind of classifications. Even today, we even in Malaysia, we also have that, like I said just now, you've got, you know, you've got the doctors, the reverends, the most reverend, right reverend. You then you go up, you've got Datos, you've got the Dato Sri, and then you've got the Tan Sri, and then you've got the Yang Bahoma, Tan Sri, Dato, you know, all that. You've got all these different titles to give us all these classifications. So in our society, even in Malaysia, we have, a, in a sense, a different class. Okay, so when you earn a certain amount of money, you get into this particular class. So the church, unfortunately, sometimes, maybe inadvertently, kind of inherits a little bit of this, okay? So then, you know, certain people in the church are regarded as more holy or certain church are, people within the church are regarded as more whatever, right? I'm not trying to say that, you know, people who serve the Lord, like, like some of the leaders in the church are bad. They're not, right? Or I'm not trying to say that a pastor is, is not, should not be treated with respect. I think the pastor should be treated with respect. But, but the, the thing is, we should not treat, you know, some of these higher class people, so-called higher class people, in a way that just completely, you know, we, 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 we allow them to bully us in that sense, or we bully them maybe, I don't know. But the idea is that we shouldn't even be bullying one another. We should be respecting and treating one another as equals, okay? Anonymously almost as it were. When we, when we are anonymous with, with some people, and people like, you know, a certain level of anonymity, there are, there are, there are functions for that, right? When, when you want to be treated equally, then you, then you become anonymous, right? Then people can treat you like a human being in a sense. So in that sense, Paul is trying to say, treat one another as equals, right? And I think that's the, the thing here, verse 12. Okay, let's carry on. Now, verse 13. Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Not only should we not judge one another, but we should also not cause another brother or sister to stumble. It means don't go and purposely go and catch out the person, lah, right? Don't go and provoke the person, lah, so to make the person even angry. Like say you are in a, let's say in a church, you are in a position of authority in some ways, okay? Or you are regarded, respected in the church for whatever reasons. 
And then because of your position, you think, okay, you know, this, 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 this guy can't do, he must listen to me. You know, I'm the so-and-so, uh, I'm the DC, uh, I'm the, you know, deacon, uh, you must listen to me. I'm in charge of this and that and also and so forth. I'm not saying that, you know, our people do this, but I'm saying that, you know, if we do this, that is like putting a stumbling block over for another brother and sister. Okay. Now I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So we look at that whole example just now, the scenario. Right? So you have this argument and you know both sides are fighting it out and say, no, la, they should you know, learn to submit to us. La. You know, come on, we are Christians. Are we going to not eat pork for the rest of the time next time? Huh? Next time we have Christmas celebration, huh? they, they, they cannot eat pork, man. You cannot eat roast pork, man. How? Right? How about how about vegetables we cook with pork blood? You know, do we have to like what you know what do we do? So big argument. Everyone's kind of very heated in their argument. And and because you cannot resolve this, we say, let's not even eat. Okay, which is not the solution either. Okay, that's that's probably a kind of neutral kind of position, like, oh, let's not fight, okay, let's not eat. Okay, but the answer is that this is not how we should also move forward. Okay. Because eating together is a very, very powerful, wonderful tool that we have to bring the church together. Eating together. It's a, it's a very intimate kind of setting, right? And we have all known in the last almost two years now, the effects of social isolation from one another. The effects of not being able to eat together, right? You know, so the dine-in thing is a big thing. Oh, you know, <laughs> unvaxxed people cannot dine in. Everybody's so upset about that, right? You're like, oh, I want to dine in. I want to dine in, right? Why? Because you want to meet with people and you want to have a nice meal with them at a nice restaurant, right? You know, and I'm sure you all miss those days. I miss those days when I could, you know, have a nice meal with friends, you know, and stuff like that. So it is it's something that we enjoy doing and the church is a perfect place to do that through our family gatherings and, you know, meeting together physically. It's very, very helpful, okay? It's very good to build that kind of communal fellowship thing. But you have a scenario like this, that, that what was shown just now, or you have a similar scenario like what, you know, we talk about in Romans, right? And that action of insensitivity on both parts cause strife and division in the church, okay? On, I mean, it, the, the, the eating together is nothing wrong with eating together. And it's nothing wrong eating pork and not eating pork. Paul is basically his thing. But when we judge one another, that is what causes the strife and division in the church, right? Among many things. But this one is a simple thing. It's just makan, ma. I mean, what's the big deal about eating? But wow, make a big, big thing, you know, wow, fighting, la, this, la, that, la, all these things. So, I mean, thankfully, I don't think we have had this problem, but, you know, this is what Paul is trying to get at. It is not about eating. It's about the judging that takes place because of the eating, okay? So, by what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. Now, he says, verse 16, so do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So, this is what Paul is saying. It's like, it's not the food. It's not about eating. It's about the attitude that we have towards one another in the body of Christ. So whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and improved man. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. So what Paul is saying is the central principle here is we need to pursue for peace and mutual upbuilding. And once that is not happening, something is wrong. Once one member, if just one member of the church feels that what they're doing, if they're doing what is right, of course, right, then the church needs to take stock. Now, let me just contrast this by saying, then you say, but then what if the person is doing wrong? Eh? Okay, yeah, that, what if the person is doing wrong? Now, if the person is doing wrong, then obviously the church should not stop for this person. Okay, now if the person is stealing, the person is committing adultery, the, the person is, I don't know, doing bad stuff, right, and, and, and the church knows it and other people know it, okay, then that's a different case. It doesn't mean that, oh, we all should not do anything. Oh, let's let, the, let this person do that, you know, whatever evil that they are doing and let, let the person carry on doing. Let's not do anything because, you know, we don't want to, you know, uh, uh, upset that whole love and all these things. No, no, no. That's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that if both sides are just trying to 
do something harmless like eating and you can get into a kind of judging kind of mentality, then don't do that. Make room for one another. Yield to one another. But if one person is doing something wrong, clearly wrong, cheating, lying, stealing, whatever, right? That person needs to be disciplined by the church, right? And there are ways to do that, right? Christ has already illustrated when, when somebody has wronged you or somebody has done something wrong, there are certain steps on how to do it. First, you go to that person personally and, and try and reason things out with that person, person to person. If that cannot happen, then you need to bring another person. And then if that you know, still cannot happen, then you need to bring you know, more people. And then finally, bring this matter up to the church. And the church has to resolve this as a body. And there needs to be a good resolution. Right? That, that is the, the, the pattern, that, an escalation pattern that Christ has already illustrated for us and given us clear instructions on that. And Paul also in other places gives examples of people doing wrong things and bad things, how the church should actually take action. But here, nobody is doing wrong except for the judging part. The judging part is the wrong thing, okay? But eating is not wrong, okay? Both sides, are the Jew not eating pork and the Gentile eating pork is not wrong according to the law per se, okay? So it's not wrong in that sense. Each is holding to their own conviction. And one says, no, I don't want to eat pork. And one says, no, I want to eat pork, right? So this is a different case, all right? We are not saying that, you know. So it doesn't mean the church... Um, tolerates evil. If it's evil, the church must do something and must, must swiftly and decisively take action on the evildoer, especially if that action is proven to be true. Uh, disciplinary action must be taken. All the way up to the pastor, if the pastor has done something wrong, it's proven to do something wrong as well. Now, so, in this case, it's not, eating is not wrong. Okay? So, uh, let's carry on. Right, now the last part here. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. So this is the conclusion of it. It means it's to say that do not cause your brother to stumble if you know what you're doing causes him to sin or causes him to be affected by what you do. Okay, and you doing it, you not doing it doesn't make a difference. Of course, it may be a bit inconvenient for you. So for example, example, going back to the scenario, and I'll give the actual result, resolution later. But let's say you don't eat pork in that celebration meeting. Will people die? Will, that, you know, will, be, will it be a big, big thing? Not really. Okay? If, you, if you replace it with other dishes, maybe, I don't know, KFC or something, you know, eat Domino's pizza, you know, nobody will really suffer right, in that sense. So what Paul is trying to say here is that if you know an action that you do will cause another person in the church to be deeply hurt and affected by your action, then don't do it. So let me give another example, okay? Let's say in the church, there's one sister that you know. I mean, okay, like she loves God, you love God, both of you love God, and she just doesn't like the color purple for whatever weird reason. Maybe the purple reminded her of some bad memory in her past and all that. And she just can't stand purple, right? Now, there's nothing wrong with not liking purple. It's just her own preference, right? Now, you have all kinds of dresses and all kinds of shirts that you can wear to church, right? You can wear a white shirt. You can wear a pink shirt. You can wear a, you know, a, a black shirt, right? But then... If you know wearing a purple shirt causes her to be upset, don't go and wear the purple shirt. Okay? That's what Paul is saying. Don't buy your eating and drinking or, you know, doing something that is not unlawful. Cause another brother and sister to be affected. Okay? If you know a particular person is affected by what you're doing and you purposely go and do it, that is putting a stumbling block in front of your brother or sister. That is what we call what we talked about in terms of provoking, right? You know this person doesn't like purple. You purposely wear purple. Nothing against purple, of course. But, you know, you purposely wear purple just to provoke this brother or sister. And they, they, they look at you and they, oh, you know, that kind of thing. And, and you're like, yeah, you know, I can wear whatever I want. You know, I'm not bound by, you know, any kind of law. And why, you know, I just don't care what you think, right? You, you, you don't like it, don't like it, like your problem, not my problem. You know, but Paul is saying, no, it is our problem. It is the problem because 
we are causing another brother or sister whom Christ has died for and paid for by his blood to stumble. It is our responsibility to love and care for another brother or sister. Now, you may say, you, you know, you're sure you don't understand, you see, I, some things I do, or sometimes I don't know, you know, I don't know uh, whether people get upset or offended by it. I say certain things, I don't, I don't mean bad things, and this so and so, later on I hear many months later, many weeks later, oh, so and so was uh, uh, offended by what I said. How do I do that? That means I cannot say anything in church, lah. I cannot, cannot say anything at all. I cannot do anything because I'm afraid this person gets offended. I'm afraid that person gets offended. I cannot do anything. Well, the answer to this is we work and walk in love. That means we don't, we're not bound by fear of offending another person. But at the same time, we don't purposely seek to offend the other person. We don't purposely seek to provoke the other person. So that is the essence of the meaning of this text. Okay, so it is the faith that you have keep between yourself and God. The faith here, I would say, if we use the word, the conviction, the personal conviction that you have keep between yourself and God, because all of us have different convictions. Okay, and later I'll give the second scenario about the, the difficulty of the personal convictions. It's very tricky and touchy subject. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself or what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats because the eating is not from faith for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Right, so let's go to the resolution. Right, now the resolution of the scenario. Okay, so what is the proper and, you know, uh, uh, in a sense, the, the proper godly, you know, way of, of resolving the issue. Okay, so let's look at this. Now, resolution, resolution. Now, based on what has been discussed above, in view of loving one another, a formal apology was made in the church bulletin to these families and a decision was made by the DC that in future, for all church celebration dinners, only halal food will be served. Out of love for the new believers in Christ who are still learning about their faith. The overriding principle here that governed the actions of the DC was, let us not destroy another faith by what we eat. Okay, so that's the resolution. Now I'm going to give you another scenario okay now this scenario is the touchy one okay now it's the most hot topic okay okay now scenario two are you ready Don't on, huh? now in a particular local church there was a small minority of unvaxxed or anti-vax members in the congregation around 10 percent since the church wanted to ensure compliance with government sops the unvax was not allowed to attend all physical services, but could only attend via Zoom or live streaming. Over time, however, there began to emerge a sense of an unvax anti vax distinctions among some of members of the church who felt that this unvax group was bringing inconvenience to the church, if not threatening the safety of the members of the church. The unvax group, on the other hand, also began to feel more and more sidelined and forgotten. When the time for the church annual AGM came along, the majority of the church members voted to have a physical in-person AGM and the unvax group was asked to not be physically present but that they would attend via Zoom and a coordinator would be assigned to a system, take their votes, you know, questions, comments and so on. The person chosen to coordinate one of the leaders in maybe the DC just happened to have a particular personal bias against the unvax. And during the course of the AGM, either consciously or unconsciously, missed out some votes and comments and questions from this unvax group, thinking that since they were only a minority, it wouldn't matter. The unvax group could also tell that the coordinator was not interested in really taking their views into consideration as they tried to get their attention, but there were multiple occasions when the coordinator did not respond. Eventually, when some other members of the church heard that some within the unvax were dismayed, about not having their contributions acknowledged, the DC called up the coordinator for an explanation. Already feeling annoyed for being targeted for something that went against their own convictions, the coordinator came to the meeting in an impatient mood. When asked, the coordinator gave fake excuses that the unvaxxed did not turn on their mics during the AGM or that they were preoccupied or, or the, the coordinator was preoccupied with other things during the meeting which led to some votes from the unvaxxed not being counted in time. Finally, the coordinator could not stand it any longer and freely express what they felt. It was just that they felt that it was just a waste of time entertaining this group that was so stubborn, cowardly, and selfish, and that they had no love for their neighbor. They did not show love for their neighbor and were endangering everyone else. 
He or she even suggested that in future, unvaxxed members should just be silent observers in major church meetings since by their cowardly actions, they have proven that they didn't dare to take the vaccine that was supposed to be able to bring about good for the whole community. And such behavior was therefore very unchristian of them. This was the view of the coordinator. When such a comment eventually got to some of the unvaxxed, a few were hurt and disappointed, feeling like the church was not giving any support for their personal convictions. What should be done to remedy the situation based on what we have just learned? Okay, now you don't have to, you know, raise your hand and stuff, right? I'll just give you the answer straight away. Okay. In my opinion, the way to resolve a scenario, a hypothetical, of course, this scenario has not happened, but you know, if a, something like this would happen, right? My suggestion is that you first have to request that the coordinator apologize to the unvax and to arrange for more sympathetic vaxxed leaders within the DC to coordinate with the unvax group in future major meetings. And the overriding principle here is let the strong help those who are weak that the strong help those who are weak. Who are the weak ones? The minority. And who are the minority? The unvaxxed group. Now, it doesn't have to be the unvaxxed group. It can be other groups in our churches. It may be the you know, uh, uh, um, people from a particular background or people with certain educational uh, limitations and stuff like that, right? You know, they may be these minorities. And if they want to honestly, sincerely serve the Lord, not do bad things, but honestly serve the Lord, then you know, the church must do what it can to accommodate for their personal convictions, okay? And finally, I will just end by, by just reminding us about the beautiful story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Now, the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus was, Zacchaeus, everyone knew, was a bad guy. As in, like, he was cheating people of money, he was rich and all that kind of thing. But Jesus reached out to him and bent over backwards, right, to go to his house. And he even risked some of, you know, some criticisms and people were just saying, oh, yeah, this guy, how can Jesus be going to a tax collector? Does he know he's, he's a, he, does he not know that he's a sinner? Of course Jesus knows, right? But why did Jesus go all out to Zacchaeus' house? Because Zacchaeus wanted to do the right thing. Zacchaeus wanted to repent. Zacchaeus wanted to put away the things of the past. Now, if Zacchaeus was unrepentant, if Zacchaeus was a man who didn't want to repent like Herod, or Pilate, or, or other people. Jesus did not even have time for these people. But because Zacchaeus wanted to do the right thing, he wanted to change from his ways, Jesus went all out. And he loved Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus wanted Jesus. And he knew he needed Jesus. Zacchaeus heard all the stories. And he was lonely. He was isolated. Everyone hated him. Right, because he, you know, he was cheating people of money and they all regarded him as a traitor. And Jesus said, Today I will come to your house. Right? And Zacchaeus was just so blown away by Jesus' love. He didn't have to do it. Jesus actually didn't have to go to Zacchaeus' house. And Jesus actually, if he went, it seemed to like Jesus was uh, affecting his own reputation. But Jesus loved to do this, not just for Zacchaeus, but for so many people, like the leper. He didn't have to touch the leper, but he touched the leper. Right? Jesus didn't have to entertain the woman, but he entertained the woman. And by right, you know, the woman with 12 years of bleeding, you know, for, in Jewish law, you're not supposed to touch a woman. And more so, you're not supposed to touch a woman who is in bleeding. So he doubly unclean, but Jesus touched or allowed the woman to touch her. So what I'm saying here is that Jesus loves us and loved us, right? And he went all out to help us. And so we, the church, should go all out to help those among us, right, who are feeling really, really left out or are feeling weak or are being dipinggirkan, you know, they are, they are being sidelined, right? The strong must help the weak. Now, you cannot say, the, the strong cannot insist, on the other hand, say, so strong cannot say, the weak must help me. Okay, let's say there's a few group, there's a small group of very, very strong people who have a lot of influence of the church. And then they say, oh, based on your thing, uh, then the weak must serve me uh, because you say, you know, I, we are a small group, so you must help us, right? That's not how we understand the scripture as well. It's those who are really at risk. 
okay, those who are really weak, like the scenario I gave earlier about those families, they are, they are really weak because their own community has rejected them and now they come to church and we reject them, let's say like, if they do. They are really in a very vulnerable position, right? And then let's say this unvax group also, they are also in a very vulnerable position because you know, they are cut off from the rest of society and the, the, the church is the only place or one of the places that they can get support. And then if the church says, no, like, yeah, you guys are just a threat to, threat to us, like, right? And you are inconvenience to all of us, right? So please, you know, just, you know. So something to really think about, right? You know, what does it mean to live and walk in love? And the answer is we look to Jesus. Always, always look to Jesus. Use him as an example. Use him as our prime example of showing love. Now, I'm not trying to say that the unvaxxed people are, are good. I'm just saying that the attitude to which we all do based on personal conviction should be one out of love and out of defending the weak and helping those who are in a more difficult position in the church. Our heart and compassion should be for them, right? And it can be, you know, like a special needs people who come to the church, right? And they want to attend the church and the church also should go all out, right? You know, bend over backwards to help these ones, right? They are the ones who the church is made to care for, right? So who are the weak among us? Who are those who need help among us today in the church and how can we help them? Or how can we make sure we don't step on them? Because that's the last thing Jesus did. He could have stepped on us, but instead he gave his life for us. Right? And his love for us should be the motivation for us to give our lives and to give our time for those who are weak among us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this time and we just pray that as we look at Christ, he's our example, that we will learn how to walk and to live in love. In Jesus' name, in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Yoswa, for bringing to us God's word. And indeed, that I would like to echo what he said, uh, that let the strong help the weak and always walk in love. For this is what we, we Christians are asked to do. So let's uh, come to the announcement. Uh, <clears throat> we, the church will, is always... Uh, welcoming uh, anyone who worships with us and especially today those who are worshipping with us for the first time if there are any one of you worshipping us for the first time we welcome you and uh, we hope that you will join us again next week and uh, this is the announcement that I'll bring to you reopening of church for fiscal worship service Okay, the DC has decided that after considering some factors and feedback by members, the reopening of physical worship service originally scheduled on the 6th of this month is postponed to the 20th of, uh, that will be next week. The following are the SOPs to be followed for physical service. So let me uh, read to you from uh, the quite a number. So I will go as the <coughs> uh, bit slower. A, only fully vaccinated members are allowed to come for the physical service. Members who are sick are not allowed to come and children below 12 years old are discouraged to join. Her members are to show their digital vaccination certificate to the ushers. B. Religious worship activities in houses of worship are allowed to the limit of attendance subject to the size and space of the house of worship, plus taking into account physical distancing of no less than one meter. And face masks are to be put on at all times and avoid all physical contacts with other members. C. There will be no gathering allowed before or after the service. Members are to disperse immediately after the service 
has entered. The members are to be are to use the main entrance to enter or exit from the sanctuary, although other doors will be open for better ventilation. E, the sanctuary and toilets will have been fully sanitized before and after use. So I hope that uh, those SOPs, you will, uh, if you have missed it or you don't really understand, uh, please contact the DC or the church office. Reopening of church office. The church office is now open with staff working on rotation. All visitors to the office must observe strict SOPs. Online banking. All offering tithes and donations must be sent online abroad to the office. Otherwise, you may request collection from home by Deacon Tan Kok Yong. The our church uh, GGPP's name is there, bank account, May Bank account is there. Food Bank. The last dis distribution was made on uh, 5th of November. So, however, do continue to give the COVID-19 fund as we will continue to help the needy here and elsewhere in other ways. And the uh, COVID-19 fund total contribution received in cash and online transfer, ring it 20,428. Less total expenditure, ring it 10,149 and 60 cents. Balance asset 1111 is ring it 10,278.40 cents. GEPP Alpha. GEPP Alpha will be on every Monday night at 8 p.m., there will be special prayers at 10 a.m. on Mondays. Please join prayers to show support for this church outreach. And also, Boys Brigade. The DC is thinking of starting a Boys Brigade company in the secondary school. If you would like to join a feasibility study, please give your name to Elder B. Lee. Closing date is 15 November. Feast stations need home visits. Contact Reverend Benedict with his number to arrange for a time. We will follow all SOPs. Thank you. Let's come together to pray. Almighty God, we give thanks and glory unto you. Thank you for your amazing grace and steadfast love for each and everyone gathered before you. Empower us, your church GBP, to proclaim the gospel and the mystery of the cross that is your love to the community here in Batapaha, that we, the church, will be the salt and light. O oh Lord, as we approach this season of Christmas, help us to remember why you came 2,000 years ago as a son of man who, <clears throat> who bought our sin and of each and every one of us to redeem and to restore us, to be children of God, to inherit the promise of eternal life. O oh Lord, as GGBP reopens for physical worship, help us to put all the SOP in place. And we ask, O oh God, for your protection and grace be upon us. That the body of Christ that come together to worship will be shielded from the COVID-19 virus. Thou, O oh Lord, our shepherd, will lead us into green pastures and guide us beside still waters. And even though we walk through the darkest valley, your rod and your staff, they will comfort us. Anoint us as GGBP embark on these projects, the Boys Brigade and the Alpha program that is already ongoing. We will 
go forth with your blessing, O God, and your guidance. We pray that lives will be transformed in the work of your kingdom will bear fruit to the praise and glory of your name. We give thanks and pray all this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us all together sing the closing hymn, Broken Vessels.
I now call upon Reverend Benedict to pronounce the benediction. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Joshua, for your sermon and uh, the teaching that you have brought forth. It's quite an interesting uh, scenario that you presented to us. And I think the church we need to take note of what has been said. I also want to say uh, to everybody, yeah, look happy, smile, okay? You are looking so serious, huh? maybe dinner time already. Huh? Okay, yeah? uh, let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. We have come to the end of the service. Thank you for worshipping with us. And uh, God will bless you as we depart from here. See you next week. Bye-bye. See all Bye. of you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you. Joshua, thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Thank you, Joshua, everyone. Thank you, thank Joshua. You. God bless. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Yosha Lao Su. Oh.